Are we, I think we're live. All right. Hello, Artie Peoples, and welcome to another episode of Jerry's Live. My name is Emmy Klein, and I'm your host this evening. And as you can see, we have the amazing Jeff Olson on the here with us again. Thank Hello, you so much. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, so today's episode is Jerry's Live 195. So Throughout uh, Jeff's amazing presentation, if you see anything that he is using that you are interested in uh, kind of snagging, make sure you, that you go to the website jerrysartrama.com and type in the search bar the code JL195 and everything he has will pull up in a teacher's cart and then you can check it out there. So without further ado, please feel free to take it away, Jeff. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me back. Excited Thanks to be having. here. Uh, happy that spring is here and sunshine is out and, and uh, get it excited for summer. And uh, we were just talking about scheming, about actually doing something in person in the fall, hopefully. So I'm yeah. excited about that. Uh, hopefully that will come about and I'll get to be out there. That would be wonderful. We can paint together. But yeah. today, since we're doing it virtual, uh, there are some benefits, right? Uh, we get lots of folks who can be here and excited to have everyone. And today I'm going to be talking about Rembrandt watercolor, specifically the special effect colors. I've got a presentation for you to kick things off and then I'm going to do a demo and show you what these paints can do. And then a surprise mixed media technique with Rembrandt pastels at the very end. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump over. I'm going to share my screen and I'll take a look at this presentation. All right, everybody see it okay? I so Rembrandt watercolor, special effect colors. What we're talking about there are very special and unique types of pigments that are used to create uh, really luminescent and radiant light effects. And I'm going to explain what those are and how they happen. Uh, but first, I'm going to dive into a few other things, uh, beginning with an introduction. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Royal Talents, Royal Talents is a Dutch company. It was established in 1899 in Appledorn in the Netherlands. And you can see a picture here from the original factory floor uh, and all those steam powered mills. Aren't those cool? Uh, but uh, we have been making paints like Rembrandt watercolors since 1899. Other brands that you're probably familiar with, along with Rembrandt oils and pastels, are of course our Amsterdam all acrylics, our Van Gogh lines, uh, our Ecoline watercolors, uh, and many, many more. Uh, we have the name Royal uh, because we received a royal predicate in 1949 uh, from Queen Wilhelmina, who is an artist and big fan of our products. And so we became paint makers to the queen, if you will, in 1949. Uh, it was for our contributions to Dutch culture and the economy at that time. And so we're very proud of that designation and live up to it, hopefully in all of what we do and endeavor to do. Um, the uh, Royal Talents North American affiliate is in Northampton, Massachusetts, was established in 2015. Now we've had our products, of course, in North America for many, many years, but it was always through a third party distributor. So now we have our own offices and distribution center in Northampton, uh, and that has made it much easier to service our retail partners and customers more effectively and, and happy about that. Uh, my name's Jeff Olson. Uh, for those of you guys who are joined for the first time, I'm the Art Education Director for Royal Talents and have been uh, since 2017. Uh, prior to that, uh, for 10 years, I was a university art educator, studio art mainly, and some art history. Uh, 20 plus years in the art material industry, uh, wearing about every hat that you can imagine, uh, primarily on the retail side, but my passion has always been for art education. And then I'm also an exhibiting artist for more than 30 years. And if you'd like to learn more about Royal Talents, Royal Talents North America, or myself, those are our websites there that you see on the screen right now. All right, let's talk about where we're going to go today. So the first thing I'd like to do is share some history about watercolor in general. So that's my in the beginning, a very brief, very, very, very brief history of watercolor, which is fascinating. Lots of fun facts to share there. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the composition of watercolor. So what makes watercolor watercolor? What's in the paint uh, itself? Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the binder. Uh, what the binder is, because it's really the binder for all paints that distinguish their special or unique working properties. Uh, the pigments are essentially the same, right? It's the same color, whether you're oil, acrylic, or watercolor, but the binder gives it its unique character. Then we're going to talk about pigments in general. Uh, I'm going to give you an overview of the three main categories of pigments based on their origin, and then I'm also going to talk about the specialty pigments that go into the effect 
paints that we're going to use today. Uh, and we're going to go and dive right into those specialty colors, along with some of the features of the line itself. And then we're going to finish up with the demo. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into it with the history first. So watercolors are not new. They are one of the original art materials, if you will. We have watercolor examples dating all the way back to Egypt, 5,000 years, 5,000 BCE to be specific, so 7,000 years, right? Um, the paints were a little bit different then. They still had the same binder, the gum Arabic binder, which I'll talk about more, but they also added resins uh, to the paint and some animal hide glues. They did some uh, type of sealing uh, over them with those uh, to make them more permanent. They worked primarily with uh, inorganic pigments, which we'll talk about uh, more in depth when we get the pigment section. So very similar to what we use today, but, but definitely unique. Uh, in Asia, uh, around 4000 BCE was the beginning or the first established watercolor uh, tradition. Uh, so very, very uh, uh, long history in Asia of watercolor painting. And by the fourth century, Chinese landscape painting, like this image that you see here on this slide, had established itself as an independent art form uh, and beautiful, beautiful landscapes. These are some of my favorite paintings uh, in the world. Uh, the wonderful kind of mystical uh, looking uh, landscapes that are done in watercolors and in inks in that Asian tradition. Next, we're going to jump into the West. So we don't get watercolors in the West until the 15th century. Uh, watercolor in Europe developed along with the art of papermaking. And so you can see this fun diagram. Uh, this is papermaking happening in Nuremberg in Germany. Uh, there were different, uh, different paper centers in that, at that time, uh, as early as 1000 uh, CE in Spain, uh, also in Italy, and, and as well as Germany here, uh, where this picture is from. And some of the earliest painters came from Germany who were using watercolor. Uh, this is Albrecht Dürer's image, the small study uh, of these grasses and, and plants. Uh, the watercolor was around, uh, obviously, right? but it really didn't uh, become ingrained in the practice until paper became available. And that really makes sense. When you look at the history of watercolor and paper, they go hand in hand. Paper is the ideal surface for the watercolor because of the binder or the characteristics of the binder. It's the best surface for adhesion. Uh, and uh, it makes sense that you would see artists developing their craft in watercolor along uh, with the development of paper. Uh, and you can see here Albrecht Dürer really revolutionized watercolor in Europe. Uh, moving it beyond just being something that you would do studies with into a finished art form in and of itself. Uh, so wonderful examples if you want to look him up, Albrecht Dürer. Uh, next we get to England. Uh, so now we're jumping to the 18th century. This is a painting in the background by Turner, uh, one of my favorite painters. Uh, he did hundreds of these wonderful watercolors. This one was one in Venice from the Grand Canal. Uh, but uh, uh, he, along with other English painters, really revolutionized watercolor painting uh, for a broader audience. And there was something else that took place in that same period, 1781, the Reeves brothers uh, are credited with the invention of the pan. And you can see the pans here. These are the, the form that many of us first become acquainted with watercolors as young children, right? Uh, painting with watercolors from the pan, but they didn't exist before then. So artists were really uh, beholden to, to make their own paints, grind their own pigments, mix their own uh, formulas, and carrying those paints around was not that easy. The pan changed all of that. Not only did it create portability for artists like Turner here to take his watercolors to Italy, uh, but it also broadened the demographic of who had access to these paints and who would have interest in it. So it opened up a whole uh, genre of enthusiast painting. So amateur painting became very popular at this time. Uh, this is also the period of the grand tour. So when English nobles were touring all over Europe, uh, no cameras back then, right? They brought watercolors with them and documented their journey in beautiful watercolors. It was also the time of exploration. Naturalists were traveling with the Brit British Navy all over the globe and document documenting their findings uh, in wonderful watercolor and ink. Uh, paintings and drawings. So uh, the pan really did revolutionize and create uh, or, or establish, I should say, watercolor as one of the dominant painting mediums across the board. All right, we get into the 19th century uh, and we have some wonderful examples here uh, by two very famous artists, Winslow Homer in the back uh, and then Mary Cassatt in the forefront. 
Uh, again, uh, the portability and the access to watercolor in the 19th century made it very, very popular with amateurs and professional painters alike. Uh, many of the Impressionists painted in watercolor, not just for studies, uh, but also for finished pieces. Uh, this piece actually uh, by Mary Cassatt is an inclusion of watercolor and gouache and pastel. So a wonderful mixed media uh, composition. Of course, this series by Winslow Homer and many of his watercolors, very, very famous and created a whole tradition in American painting. Oops, sorry about that. All right, so now we get to the 20th century. So watercolor has not gone away. Uh, it may have fallen out of favorability with professional artists with the predominance of oil painting uh, in the 20th century and then with the beginning of acrylic painting in the late 20th century. But watercolor very much is still part of the contemporary art scene. Of course, we had that wonderful image by Georgia O'Keeffe, probably the most famous uh, American painter using watercolor in the 20th century. But even now in the 21st century, we have artists like Paula Rego who in this wonderful inset here, she's a, a Portuguese painter, uh, painting out of New York though, I believe. Uh, wonderful, wonderful works about domestic life uh, and the lives, uh, trials and tribulations, if you will, uh, through her ex personal experiences. Um, but they're very powerful uh, paintings and definitely worth taking a look. So the watercolor medium has grown, evolved and adapted to the intents and purposes of contemporary painters uh, around the world. All right, let's talk about the paints themselves. So what goes into a watercolor paint? There are really four primary ingredients. First is the coloring agent, so the pigment or the dye. Uh, and you can see some paint being made here in this inset. Uh, pigment uh, is the primary coloring agent in artist paints, and that's because of its light, fast quality. Uh, pigments, uh, for the most part, range from fair to excellent in light fastness. Uh, an artist grade paint will always have excellent light fastness, and I'll talk about what that means uh, here in a little bit. You can see the little plus signs on these pans. That talks, that's our symbol for light fast, excellent light fast rating. But I'll go into that a little bit more. So pigments, and then also dyes. Dyes uh, are fugitive. They're not light fast. Uh, they have varying degrees of light fast, usually poor to fair. Um, but they get a bad rap, I think, because there are opportunities uh, where uh, dye-based colors can be very useful and preferable. Uh, they are very luminescent, very saturated, uh, very radiant, uh, and they often reproduce better digitally. Uh, so folks who are not as interested in archival quality of something but more ephemeral works, especially those being re reproduced or shared on social media, for example, dye-based colors can be very, uh, very good. Uh, the main or primary binder uh, for watercolor paints is gum arabic and that's what is used in all of the rembrandt line a uh, very pure uh, high quality type of gum arabic and i'll talk about that a little bit more there are also other ingredients in watercolors including preservatives and flow enhancers things like glycerin and ox gall ox gall is exactly what it sounds like comes from uh, bovine uh, but uh, uh, these preservatives in the case uh, of organic pigments uh, help to preserve those pigments over time. Uh, flow enhancers are added to help the color distribute and disperse more effectively throughout the paint and on the paper when you're painting. Uh, and then of course, water. Water is the main solvent uh, for watercolors and, and uh, many, many techniques uh, in using water both on the paper and in the paint uh, to create that familiar radiance that we all have come to love and enjoy with watercolor painting. All right, so the binder. What is gum arabic? So gum arabic comes from the sap of the acacia tree. So the acacia tree, one of the oldest living organisms on the planet, uh, most of the gum arabic is harvested in farms uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see some of the gum arabic being pulled off of the acacia trees here in this inset pitcher uh, and being gathered up in this basket. Uh, those are ground down and then refined into uh, fluid forms normally that we use. Uh, if you go to the store, for example, uh, and you can check on Jerry's online too, I'm sure they have some gum arabic uh, that they sell to in, in the bottle. Uh, that we can use to add to our watercolor paints or create our very own watercolor paint. And here you can see uh, in the inset some watercolor being made in our uh, facility in Royal Talents. So gum arabic is very interesting. Uh, like all binders, it has two main purposes. One is the suspension of the pigment. So pigment uh, is like adding sand into water. 
you can stir it up and it'll distribute, but eventually it uh, will settle back down on the bottom. So the binder has to be able to suspend or hold that pigment in place because it doesn't dissolve into the binder. It maintains its physical characteristic. Dyes, like I talked about earlier, those actually dissolve into uh, the binder completely uh, and into the water completely. Uh, so they create what we call as a solution uh, and very different situation. Their suspension is not needed. Uh, so it's a different process altogether. But for most paints, we're talking about pigment. So the binder needs to be able to suspend those pigments in place. And then of course it needs to adhere it to the surface. So that's where the adhesion comes in, right? Uh, it needs to hold the color uh, onto the surface uh, ground that we're painting on. Uh, and in some cases uh, with many paints, it also creates what we call a paint film. So that protective coating over the pigment. This is where gum arabic is unique. Gum arabic is actually absorbed into the paper as it dries and leaves virtually the pigment just lying on top of the paper. That's one of the reasons we can lift watercolor, uh, one of the reasons it's permeable, uh, that we can re-wet it and reactivate it uh, because of the special nature of the gum arabic binder. All right, let's talk about pigments. So much to say about pigments. You see this wonderful, wonderful picture. So these are actually sacks of pigment in the dry room. Uh, at the Royal Talons uh, factory uh, in Appledorn. Uh, we get these big bags of these just super brilliant colors. It's pretty exciting to see these in person. And they come from all over the world. And pigments come from all over the world in terms of their sources and in different parts of nature. So we characterize pigments based on origin as either being organic, inorganic, or synthetic. Uh, organic are those that come from plants or animals. Uh, you can see here a very uh, uh, famous uh, source of pigment. This is for the color carmine. This uh, color is the cochineal uh, beetle, or cochineal is also the name for the, for the pigment uh, that goes into the color carmine. This little guy would sacrifice his life for centuries uh, for this beautiful red. It was used by the Aztecs as early as the fourth century BC. Uh, the Spanish uh, imported or I should say exported from uh, the New World uh, to uh, Europe at the time, uh, the color, and it became famous and a color preferred by Baroque painters, for example. Um, this little guy here is indigenous to, to Central uh, and South America. He breeds on the underside of prickly pear cactus, uh, and uh, that's how it's harvested still today. Uh, most of our paints today, we use a synthetic version of this, so we're not using uh, these guys anymore for the paint, although there are still some sources of the color red that uh, use cochineal. And interesting enough, uh, on the term cochineal, make sure you, you pronounce it right. I, I made the mistake recently of not pronouncing it correctly. So it's cochineal in English, it's uh, cochineal in Spanish, uh, but uh, uh, cochineal in Spanish means filthy, not uh, cochineal bug. So <laughs> it's cochineal in English, but cochineal in Spanish. Uh, just a fun factor in the origin uh, of this wonderful pigment. Uh, the next category are inorganic pigments. So these are mineral-based pigments, some of the oldest pigments uh, that we find, like the ones uh, in the Egyptian uh, papyrus that I showed at the beginning, uh, are based on inorganic pigments. Uh, these pigments include the oxides, the earth colors, siennas, the umbers, all those really rich earth colors are mineral-based. Uh, this color here is probably the most famous. This is ultramarine. This stone is lapis lazuli. Uh, it is mined almost exclusively uh, in the mountains of Afghanistan. Uh, Venetian traders gave it its name. Uh, ultramarine loosely means from beyond the sea or over the sea. Uh, in the Renaissance, this pigment was highly prized by artists. You had to have money uh, to afford it, so you had to have good patronage. Uh, it was and still is worth uh, its weight more than gold. Uh, for example, so it's a semi-precious stone. Uh, and the church even went as far to regulate its use uh, so that it could only be used on particular subjects. You'll often see ultramarine used at the time, uh, for example, in the cloak or robe of the Virgin Mary. Um, but it was uh, regulated, restricted. Uh, but of course, just like with the cochineal, uh, we use uh, a synthetic version of ultramarine today. Uh, that is a much less expensive. As a matter of fact, I think most ultramarine colors are a series one in paint lines. So really uh, affordable and still beautiful, beautiful color. So this brings us to synthetic pigments. 
Synthetic pigments begin their life as either an organic or inorganic material, and then we synthesize them. This could be heating them up, uh, mixing them or exposing them to other chemicals or materials. Uh, and it is something uh, that we do to many of the modern colors that we use today. But synthesizing pigments is nothing new. Uh, we've been doing it for centuries. Artists are alchemists, if you will, always looking for new ways to make color and, and create new types of images. What you're seeing in this little uh, image here is the making of lead white or flake white. Uh, you would take coils of lead, as you see here, you would uh, expose or submerge them in vinegar. Uh, sometimes they were wrapped in cow dung to generate heat, and it would produce oxidation that would create this crust of white onto the lead. And then that was flaked off into a bowl, dried in the sun, ground up into what was the most popular white pigment from the 15th century until the 20th century. And there are still uh, oil painters, especially, who prize lead white for its unique qualities. So that's an example of a synthetic pigment. And this last image I added uh, is because we're going to talk about uh, the specialty pigments uh, that are used in the special effects Rembrandts. Uh, and these are unique. They uh, start as an inorganic pigment. They're a type of mica flake, which is a type of mineral. And then that mineral is synthesized through oxidation. And layers of oxidation create uh, what is essentially a prism that light travels through and heightens the reflective nature of the pigment itself. So let's explore that for a little bit. So we've got our uh, categories of pigments here based on origin. Now we're gonna talk about categories of pigment based on how they refract or reflect light. So traditional pigments like this turquoise blue are what we refer to as one dimensional pigments. So the light comes down, hits the pigment surface and the dominant light wave is reflected back and that's how we perceive color. So light travels in waves, hits the surface. Most of those light waves are absorbed. And then what we see reflected back uh, is received in our eyes uh, uh, on our little cones uh, in there uh, as a color. So we perceive that color or that light wave as being blue. So that's a one dimensional pigment. Two dimensional light like this metallic color that we see here here uh, act as a mirror. So it hits that mica pigment uh, and all of the light waves are reflected back just like a mirror does. Uh, and then depending on the thickness uh, and the origin of the uh, uh, pigment itself, we, we, we interpret it as being gold or copper or bronze, uh, but it reacts very differently than a traditional one dimensional pigment in the fact that we get all of those light waves coming back and that metallic type of surface reflection, just like a mirror would reflect light or reflect light. And then finally, our interference pigments. These are super cool. And I'll show you, when you see them in person, you'll be amazed uh, if you've never been ex uh, experienced or exposed to these before. So these uh, start just like the two-dimensional pigments we, we saw before with the mica base. Uh, and then there are many layers of oxidation that are built upon it. And as many layers as there are, are what denote what color we see. Light waves have different strengths to, in terms of their ability to penetrate a surface. And you can see here in the example, as they come down, they go to different depths. And depending on the thickness of that pigment, we'll see a different combination of colors. And we call them interference pigments because you can see here in the example, the light waves actually interfere with each other. Uh, I like to use the example of a soap bubble, right? The light hits it, some of it bounces off of the surface of that soap bubble, but it also penetrates the bubble and bounces around inside and gives us that rainbow effect. And that's exactly what's happening with an interference pigment. It's like having thousands of little light prisms inside of the color. Really uh, exciting to see. And then finally, uh, in these specialty colors, I have the spark and chameleon colors. These are really, really fun. The main difference here uh, from what we saw with the interference pigments or the metallic pigments is that instead of being on mica, they're built up on a glass base and that gives them even an extra charge uh, and uh, sparkle, if you will, uh, when you see them, you're just going to be blown away uh, in the demo. All right, so here are the specialty colors. Uh, they come in dusk colors. Uh, we have the metallics, the interference colors, the chameleon colors, and the spark colors. And a couple things to denote. This is actually from the color chart uh, of all the Rembrandt colors. And one few things I want to point out. Uh, first, you see this indication here. We've got the little plus signs. We have a number. We have a little box here that's half dark, half light, a number. Uh, and then we have the words coated mica underneath. So 
What do these things mean? So the plus signs refer to the light fast quality of the paint. So all of these special effects colors with the exception of that dusk pink there have an excellent light fast rating. That's a hundred plus years under museum light conditions. That the high, that's the highest light fast rating that a color can receive. So these colors are, are all our archival. Say that three times quick. Uh, that number 840 is our proprietary number. So that graphite pigment We've given the designation at 840. So whether you're working with watercolor or acrylic or oil, 840 will tell you that you're using the same pigment from medium to medium. So that's our proprietary number system. Uh, that little box there that you see that's half blocked in, that talks about the opacity of the paint. So if it was just an empty square, that would be completely transparent. If it just had a line going diagonally through it, that would be semi-transparent. This symbol means semi-opaque which is unique for watercolors, right? Most watercolors are transparent or semi-transparent. So these colors are semi-opaque. And if that square were completely blacked in, that would be an opaque color. Uh, and uh, there are almost no opaque colors in watercolor lines with some exceptions of some of the whites that are available, right? So that's the uh, meaning of this on the color chart. And these symbols also appear on the tubes and I'll share those with you and on the boxes for the pans uh, as well. One other thing I wanted to point out here too, you can see, uh, in the dust colors, you actually see pigment numbers. So those are color index numbers is how we refer to them. Pigment black, pigment yellow, uh, you see there PBK, PY, and the numbers designate the pigments. For these other specialty colors, we actually refer to the material itself. So these are coated mica chips. Uh, and then when we get to the spark and chameleon colors, they are coated glass chips. Pretty cool. All right, let's talk about the Rembrandt watercolors on broad terms, and then we'll get into the demo. So Rembrandt watercolors actually were in introduced in 1899, the, the year we started. So the oils and the watercolors by Rembrandt are our two flagship lines. Uh, for uh, the range in total, it's a professional range, 120 colors total, uh, many, many colors to choose from. Uh, the specialty colors are included in that, uh, and we just showed those. Uh, superior pigment to binder ratio. So there's a highest level of pigment saturation in the Rembrandt line. So you're not going to get any paint with any more pigment than you would with these. This is an excellent uh, combination of uh, pigment and binder. Uh, they're the finest pigments in a pure quality gum arabic binder. So these are, are high quality pigments and those are standardized uh, throughout uh, the line. Uh, for excellent working properties. The gum arabic is also of the highest uh, quality. Uh, and uh, gives you excellent adhesion to the surface as well as color distribution. Uh, they're extra fine grind on a triple roll mill. A lot of folks only talk about how much pigment is in the paint, but milling or how the pigment is ground on the mill is also of equal importance because it's what ensures the best distribution and suspension of the pigment and gives color uh, uh, the luminescence that we expect uh, from a high quality professional line like this. I already talked about the light fast ratings, so 100 plus years, uh, excellent light fast ratings for all of the Rembrandt colors with the exception of that dust pink. Uh, very pure and transparent colors. Uh, you're gonna see uh, that you have a real direct painting medium. And this is something I love about all of the lines by Royal Talents. And that is that these paints are manufactured with the intention of the user in mind. Meaning you have to do very little to these colors to get them to work uh, and do what you want. You don't need a lot of mediums for them. Uh, they also have exclusive colors. Exclusive colors are those colors that are used only in art materials for artists, things like cadmiums and cobalts, uh, for example. Uh, you could, I guess, paint your house or your car with a cadmium or a cobalt. It'd be pretty expensive, and I'm probably now that I say it out loud, somebody's probably done it, you know, but uh, almost exclusively these colors are used in the making uh, of paints, uh, pigments, and uh, they are more expensive. They're uh, more expensive to source, more expensive to manufacture, uh, and so they cost a little bit more, and you would typically only find them in a professional paint line. Uh, formulated for consistency and ease of use, which I talked about already. One of the things I love about the Rembrandt and all the Royal Talents paints uh, and then also include uh, the permanent matters and transparent iron oxides that Rembrandt is really known for, not just in our watercolors, but our oils, uh, that very famous Dutch palette. All right, let's get to painting. So I'm going to switch this off for stop share. See now, everybody um, again. Any questions before, before we jump? There are a few questions actually based off your demo. So 
I wanted to jump into those. Um, uh, Anastasia asked, did pans come before tubes for watercolors? So pans, 1871, tubes, actually 1841. So John Rand invented the tube, 1841. Uh, and fun. then the pans were the Reeves brothers, 1871. So great question. Uh, both were very influential uh, in terms of the impact that they had on who was painting. I see the tubes having a broader impact in the oil painting world, for example. Mm -hmm. and I'll often talk about that when I do presentations on oils. Uh, a lot of people credit the paint tube uh, for the impressionist movement, the ability to carry those paint tubes out into the field. But pans really had a bigger impact for watercolors historically in terms of the broad demographic and the real portability of the medium. It makes sense. Uh, now, uh, Colleen was asking, do you happen to know the name of that Mary Cassatt piece that you had shown? Self -portrait. It was a combination of it's watercolors and self-portrait, yeah. It was her self-portrait? Self-portrait, yeah. Beautiful. I believe, um, I believe it was from the National Gallery, but I can double check and put that in the comments. Nice. Um, there's also a question about uh, the synthetic pigments that you were talking about. Are all synthetic pigments archival with a great light fastness? You know, that. most synthetic pigments are very archival. It's one of the reasons they were synthesized. So. Uh, as I was saying, when we look at the origin of pigments, we categorize them as either being organic or inorganic. Mm -hmm. Many organic pigments were fugitive or not very light fast. So one of the reasons they were synthesized or altered was to improve that light fast quality. Uh, so almost all synthetic pigments are very light fast, very archival. There certainly are some exceptions out there, especially uh, uh, in some you know, more you know, in poor grades of types of pigments, but in artist pigments, uh, you're going to find exceptional uh, light fast synthetic pigments. Wonderful. Um, now, somebody was talking about uh, the cost of colors. Does that depend on their origin? Sometimes, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, those exclusive colors I talked about, like cobalts and cadmiums, cobalt, for example, there's only a couple places in the world where it's mined. It's actually a synthesizing, uh, I think it's copper and zinc together. Um, it's been done for a long time. Uh, most cobalt's used in batteries, right? We're all carrying them around in our cell phones and, and whatnot. But cobalt uh, only comes from a couple places in the world. It's a very expensive to manufacture, very dangerous. The name cobalt actually comes from the German cobalt, which means goblin, uh, because the folks who used to mine it and synthesize it had very short lifespans. It, it gives off a, a sulfuric acid and sulfuric dioxide gases uh, that, uh, that shorten your lifespan when you're around them a lot. Um, so they're dangerous, expensive to handle, expensive to manufacture, and the origin is very rare. So that adds to the cost, yeah. uh, absolutely. And doesn't it also add to the cost when it's um, like a harder pigment, so it's harder to grind down? C certainly, so that's the origin, and then there's the processing or manufacturing, and sub-pigments have to go through the mill many, many times. Um, and the more they go through the mill, that's more labor and more time on the floor and more cost involved in the manufacturer. Absolutely. All right. Two more questions. Um, with the specialty colors, you said the light fast ratings are really high. They're excellent. The highest they're that excellent. you can. Um, but do you still recommend framing them in a glass with glass over them for protecting? I would take the same precautions that I would with any uh, watercolor with these. They don't need extra UV protection uh, uh, in terms of having to put some kind of UV glass over them. Certainly putting glass over watercolor uh, when it's going to be on display is advisable because it is a permeable surface, right? It's, it's subject to uh, moisture uh, and uh, uh, because it can be re-wet and is permeable, it should be protected when on display. So the same precautions that you would take for any watercolor I would also apply to these specialty pigments. And the last question, uh, do these specialty colors contain uh, some kind of a preservative like a honey? Um, they do not contain honey. <laughs> I can say that. Um, that does not mean that preservatives aren't used though. So it depends on the pigment itself. Most of these pigments though are inorganic. Uh, so preservatives are really not necessary when you're talking about mica or glass. Um, and the, what gives them their color is the level of oxidation on top of that, not the addition 
of another combination of color or pigment that would require that. Um, but there certainly are ingredients that are added to paints to increase the flow uh, and to preserve the quality over time. So, so uh, but I do not believe honey is something that's going to be found in, in the Rembrandt anyway. I found that a lot more in um, gouache. Is, honey can be that. used a lot in gouache and there are some watercolors out there use it and it's certainly something you can add to the paint uh, and, and create some really intriguing effects. So absolutely. Makes it flow differently. Yeah. So. yeah. Awesome. Let's uh, get into Let's the paint. demo. Yes. All right. Let me switch my camera here. All right. Everybody see that okay? All right. I'm going right. to actually uh, switch the view as well so you guys can see him bigger. There you go. All right, let's go. So this is our giveaway today. I wanted to share this with everybody. We're going to be giving away this box set of the special effects color. This is the pan set. This is what it looks like in the box. And this is what it looks like open up. Uh, and I just want to, it comes with a little travel brush in there. That's really fun. And these pans are removable and adjustable. So you can kind of create your own palette over time too, uh, since you can buy these individually. But I just wanted to show you some of the effects. So when you look at it straight on, uh, you see these colors, but I start to tilt it to the light. Look at that. Isn't that cool? How it just starts to radiate the different hues and chroma out of them. And that's what's going to happen on the surface of your painting. And what I really want to share with you, and, and probably the most important thing I want to emphasize today, is these are great all by themselves, but they are wonderful when you put them in combination with other colors. And that's what I'm going to share today. So this is the pan set uh, that we're going to be giving away. And it shuts up real nice. It's got a little uh, clip on to hang on when you're painting. So really convenient out in the field. So I've got some cold press uh, watercolor paper. This is a sheet of the Fabriano. Uh, but the real star today on papers is our Van Gogh uh, paper right here. This is a black watercolor paper, cold press, 140 pound, uh, really tough, versatile paper, and really, really fun uh, shows off the characteristics of these specialty colors. Uh, and that's what I'm going to show uh, today. So I'm going to let those sit right there. I also have the Rembrandt in the tube today. And of course, I got a couple things, uh, containers of water here to the side. Uh, you have usually two I like to work with, one for cleaning and one for painting. Uh, and then I have the tubes too. And the 20 mil tubes uh, are available and they're listed uh, as part of the demo. Uh, and I've got a couple here and let me show you the ones I'm going to be using. This is the light gold. And you can see again, the symbols that we saw in the presentation are here on the tube itself. Excellent light pass rating, semi-opaque, and then the proprietary color number. And I'm gonna go ahead and put some of this light gold. I have a little porcelain egg uh, holder here as my palette, um, but any type of watercolor palette is great uh, for this. So that's the gold. I'll set that aside here up there at the top. Then I have the interference blue. Uh, a lot of people refer to these colors as pearl colors. And you'll see when I put it in the palette what I mean. And I'll hold this up closer to the camera too in a minute uh, so you can see that. But they literally look like little pearls in uh, the palette. And here we have the spark color. So this is one that's on a glass based pigment rather than the mica. Put that guy in. And you will see that uh, when I show that closer to literally you can see the sparkle of it. And then the chameleon colors and you'll notice on these that you'll see the different color names. So this is gold, red, violet. So these chameleon colors actually shift as your uh, perspective shifts onto the surface and it shifts between these three hues. And, and that's something you'll see on the surface today uh, when we're mixing these colors and in the palette. And then my traditional color I'm going to be using to mix with today, uh, with all these colors to kind of show them off, I've got a cobalt violet, beautiful uh, violet. I'll put that over here. All right, so let's look at these more closely in the palette. So here we've got the gold. And there's the interference. See what I mean by looking like a little pearl. And then there's the spark. You can see the little extra kick that the glass-based pigment gives, and then the chameleon color. You can see the different colors just looking at it, right? Get that violet, that gold, green, really nice. All right, so let's see what these look like on the surface of our paper. So the black really makes these colors dance. Uh, but one thing I really like to show off is the opacity of these colors, especially the metallics. Mix some of that color there. 
I love these metallics. You're going to question, geez, is that a watercolor? Just because the opacity is so uh, strong. So there's the watercolor on the surface. And then I'm going to come over onto the white so you can kind of see the difference that these colors have. So there's the gold. Let's go ahead and take a close look at it so you can see that. Really nice coverage there. And it has the similar effect on the lighter dark paper. Now the difference of the color in the ground is really important to a watercolor typically because watercolors for the most part are transparent, right? What happens on the white surface is all those light waves are being reflected back at us. On the black surface, all those light waves are being absorbed. And when you have a transparent paint, the light waves are coming back up through the paint. Where here, they're being absorbed, uh, so only the paint can reflect back. Uh, and that's really important. You'll see how that impacts what we're doing with the colors today. So this is the interference blue. And we'll see it on the dark surface. But look what happens on the light surface almost nothing. It's like it's invisible, right? So you can see the significant difference and the unique quality uh, of the pigment that it radiates so much more light on a dark ground, uh, but there's so much light coming through from the white paper, we don't see the effect as much until we start to tilt the color. And as it dries, it becomes uh, even more apparent. All right, so that's the metallic. Now the interference blue. Now let's get to these spark colors. Now, uh, there was one question real quick. Uh, the, the black Van Gogh paper, is that cotton? It is not a cotton rag paper, no. It is acid free, but it's not an archival rag paper. So just look at the brush there. You can see the little glass pigments. Isn't that cool? All right, and then it just dances on the surface. But again, on the white paper, you barely see anything until we get it up towards the camera and start to tilt it, and then you see the color come out. But here you can see the advantage of working with these colors on a dark ground. And then finally, the chameleon color. This is like the spark color and the interference colors mixed together. Get a little bit of both of those types of effects. You can see it. <laughs> it's just such a fun thing to experience, especially in, purpose, in, in person. Wonderful lilac. Well, let me hold that up again. So there are the colors. Nice opacity there, but here, you really have to turn and shift. Now, so a lot of people are asking, sorry, um, they're asking if the uh, brushes that you use with the, the these pigments, would you recommend a synthetic brush? Um, because, I mean, does the glass particles get stuck in the brush, like in the bristles? I'm using a synthetic brush here, uh, and I, I always recommend those uh, in general. Um, I do not feel that you would have any problem using a traditional sable with these paints, though. You're not going to see any problems with these pigments getting stuck. Um, I don't, even in the cleaning process of them, uh, it all comes out pretty pretty easily, even in the rewetting of them. I just like the durability of the synthetic. And today, so many synthetics uh, are so uh, nice to work with. And, you know, in the last 20 years, there's been a, a revolution, really, and a jump in the quality that you get. But of course, and the, uh, the brush you're using there is the Mimic Kolinsky, yes? Yep. Mimic yep, Kolinsky Sable. Yep. That should is. be in the, in the teacher's cart for everyone who's looking at those. Um, that is, again, the code is JL195. If you go to the website, jerrysartorama.com. So he's using the 10 round. This is the 10 round. And I've been using the larger one just for this portion of the demo, just so I can get a lot of color down and you can experience that. All right, one more look at that. So you can kind of see it there. You can see where these would make great glazes too, right? Look at that wonderful gold. 
All right, so those are the colors. Now let's look at where I really feel the potential of these colors are. They're great by themselves and they can be used in a lot of different ways, but where they're really uh, exciting is when we do mixtures with other more traditional colors. So I'm gonna get into this cobalt violet now. I'm just going to do a little piece of it uh, up here on the black so you can see what I mean. So this is going to be a traditional watercolor onto a black surface. Now this is a semi-transparent color and you can see how the black paper really sucks up most of the color and it, it, it'll be even more so as it dries as the binder settles down. But nothing like the impact of the interference or excuse me the specialty colors the metallic the interference the spark and the Camille and on the black paper. Not the same effect. Of course, when we get to a traditional surface and with the violet, we get a much different effect with that nice granulating type of color from this cobalt violet. So now let's mix them with the others. This is where it really gets fun. You can really get some dynamic color mixtures. So I'm going to mix in with the gold here. Get a little more of that gold in there. Violet. And you can play around with how much you want to tint it. I'm going to try to get pretty close to the middle. All right, so here is our cobalt violet all by itself. Now we're going to get in here with our mixture of the gold and the cobalt violet. A much more subtle, almost kind of an earth color. Really nice. Now let's try it with that blue. Mix it in this blue. Get some of that violet. And remember here are the colors uh, above it too. I'll try to stay close so you can see them compared to how they were before. So there's the violet with the interference blue. All right, this is the spark. I'll get a little bit of it on the brush. There we go. And then finally, the chameleon color. Let's see how those look. Nice. So nice subtle changes from that original violet. And we get some wonderful mixtures as a result. So here is on the black paper, the colors by themselves. You can see the nice reflective quality. And then the mixtures with the cobalt violet. There you can see some of the color pick up too. I like the shift in that one. The blue and the violet really get a rich kind of purple. There's the spark. And I really like that gold. I, I feel like these, especially the metallics, I've been using a lot of these with the acrylics lately. And I get these wonderful earth type tone colors. And you can increase or decrease the amount uh, to make the, the effect more subtle. Uh, or more extreme, uh, depending on how close or how much you want it to lean towards the, the metallic and its feel. So those colors on a traditional white paper. All right, so let's go and I'll show you a fun, fun way to work with these in conjunction with pastel. I have some of the micro sets here with me today. These are uh, going to be on the, uh, the list, um, but you can find them just in the general uh, Jerry site. There's a great price on these. These are micro sets. There are five different colors uh, and it's only $5.97 right now. Uh, what a great deal. I mean, you, can, uh, you can't even get two whole sticks for the price of this and you get five colors. The color numbers are on the side. They're all uh, the same hue uh, and various tints or shades. So if you're familiar with pastel numbers, this number five 
at 0.5, that's the pure hue. The lower numbers, 0.3, for example, 0.2, those are with black added, so those are the shades. And then the higher the numbers here, you have a seven, eight, and nine. These are the tints with white. And so you can see that nice gradation. So you get a nice range with each of these, really convenient to pick up. I'm gonna be working with the, the yellows, the warm yellows today. Uh, and I wanted to show you how you can mix these colors with pastel to create kind of a gouache effect. Pastels and watercolor are just kind of a natural partner. They both have a, a water uh, soluble binder, so they work really well. Of course, pastels are always so dramatic on a dark toned ground like this, right? When you start adding the paints to them, it just opens up a whole slew of opportunities. All right, I'm gonna use a little bit smaller brush this time. Same brush, just a different size. This is the number six. All right, let's get into that gold. So here's the gold by itself up top. Now let's mix it with this pastel directly in. So what happens is you start to pick up the pastel. Literally, you're working on dry pigment, right? And it creates a more opaque color akin to a gouache and also the colors start to mix. Now the gold is really similar to the yellow here, right? But it's creating really fun, almost an ochre type color. Now we're going to get more intense. Oh, that's nice. And I'll show you the reflective quality that it's adding to the surface as well. So this is the spark. Here we're going to get a nice green. Oh, you know, I jumped ahead there. I'm going to have to switch over to the gold on this other side. I just it was too excited. I had to get to that spark. There we go. So here you can see the difference when you get closer. So there's the gold all by itself, but how much more opaque it is over the pastel and slight nuance and changes to the hue as well. All right, I'm gonna do the spark now. It's always so impatient. Give myself a little more color here too. This is the spark green. All right, so there's the green by itself. Now let's mix it with this tint of the yellow. Nice. Just fun uh, extensions of colors that you wouldn't find in either of the individual mediums, but bringing them together kind of pulls the characteristics of both. Nice. Let's look at these now. There's the color all by itself and mixed with the white pastel and yellow and of course this one at the bottom this one's really nice that's a beautiful color you can see the shifts and it just it starts to increase as it dries too all right let's go back to the interference blue since i skipped over all right right into that pastel. You should get some nice greens out of these combinations when you get down here below. nice. This is the dynamic nature of the palette. I like this, how you can push it and you can, you know, control this too, how much uh, you want the pigment of the watercolor or the pastel to dominate and you can create these variations in lines. 
really nice effect. You see as they're starting to dry, like look at those spark colors start to dry and then you get to see the full impact of those specialty pigments. All right, now let's jump over last but not least, the chameleon color. This is gonna be almost a complimentary combination. We should get a nice tertiary color here. I'm gonna need a little bit more. Oh, that's fun. There you go. That's mixing with the pastel. That is, I really like that. Such nice nuance changes. And you can go back over them with the pastel too. This is something I like. You can come back into the colors and work right back over. Create some kind of fun textures and edges to these as well. Show you what I'm talking about. If you come back over. Playing with texture with pastels, especially on a, a cold pressed watercolor paper like this, so much uh, energy in the mark making. And then you come in with that kind of saturation of color with the watercolor and combine the two and just kind of the overlapping in between these spaces. You can kind of see the potential in creating naturalistic imagery, a landscape, you know, textures and surfaces of stones industrial surfaces or just the abstract quality of it as well so those are the pastels let's go back and take a look at these as they're drawing because that effect increases so here we can see the shifts in the color these are original uh, metallic interference blue spark green and the chameleon color and you can see the chameleon shift there as it dries it's just such a fascinating interaction of light and color. And then here was where we were just on the white surface. And you can see as they dried, the dominance of the pigment comes through, the binder kind of settles down and is absorbed into the paper. And you get these wonderful nuances of color. And here's mixed with that cobalt violet. And look now how the color shift, look at that last one, the chameleon color pops. This is a nice color here too, that richness. Shift to the blue. And you turn it a nice earthy quality to this color by mixing the gold with that cobalt violet and then finally our pastels all right let's talk shop what do you think that was amazing um i'm trying to also sorry Trying to remove the pin here, um, just so everyone can see everything, uh, and then switch the view so everyone can see me. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> no I was trying to pin your screen because it kept flipping back to me because I think oh. there's a like a noise that's going off just in the outside area, so it kept flipping to me. So I do <laughs> apologize to our viewers for that, and thank you for being patient. Um, no but. Worries. I was trying to be as quiet as possible so it would stay on your screen. Um, <laughs> that was incredible. I never thought that you could mix pastels and watercolors. And I know a lot of people in our comments are also saying the same thing. Um, there was one question that I don't know sure. if you can answer. Maybe you can. Uh, do you have any examples of artwork that you've used these watercolors in your own work? Um, I use the same pigments in my acrylics. Mm -hmm. I don't paint as much with watercolor, um, but uh, you can like actually the painting behind me has combinations of metallics and uh, interference pigments mixed in with traditional colors to give you kind of a more nuanced uh, effect. It's kind of hard to see the angle of light here, but but actually you do. You're seeing some of the highlights in these colors where there are metallic colors mixed in. Uh, these have some graphite metallics mixed into them. 
Um, so it does, it creates, um, well, I think it creates a life on the surface of the painting that doesn't exist otherwise. So as you walk around it, um, it interacts with you in a more dynamic way as the light shifts and these pigments catch the light in different areas. It brings your attention to different parts of the painting. So it enables you to create focal points um, and, and contrast in other ways besides just value and hue. Uh, now you can work with the reflective nature of the surface itself uh, to create interest and drama. And, and that's something that I really like. Uh, and it works the same with the acrylics as it does with the watercolor. So uh, that same nuance of surface quality and light refraction uh, brings your paintings to life in a way that they wouldn't have been before. Uh, a lot of people, I think, as these pigments have evolved over the last several years, looked at them kind of as gimmicky, right? Like, oh, it, it, that's great for painting unicorns and merry-go-rounds and other fun stuff. Not that there's anything they wrong are. with that. They absolutely I like, there's a lot are. of unicorns that are cool out there. Uh, and there are certainly things in nature uh, uh, where these colors make sense. Uh, somebody was given the example of like a dragonfly's wings or something like that, mm -hmm. where in nature, those pigments exist, right? Mm -hmm. I, I could see it on um, the the blackbirds, like a, a raven, uh, you know, how they have that metallic sheen on their exactly. on their feathers. Exactly. And that's the same light effect that's happening in the pigmentation of the, the animal's feathers uh, and skin. And, and um, when you mix them with colors, that's where it just, for me, becomes a whole new game because you can add or decrease luminosity into the paint uh, by mixing them with your traditional you know, one dimensional color and create color mixtures uh, that not only shift in hue, but also shift in luminosity. And that's something that's just really exciting to play with. Well, there, it was really awesome to see them like in action, uh, just to kind of see how they flow on paper. That's, that's, I love your demos just so I can see all the ways they move. <laughs> um, there was one person asking, and I, I apologize, I have to kind of scroll back. Um, do the special effects paints affect the granulation of the color that you mix it with by any chance? You know, that's a great uh, question because they do have an impact on colors um, differently. So if you're mixing with granulating colors, uh, those granulating colors, um, because of the way they dry on the surface and settle into the valleys, they're heavier pigments, typically mineral-based pigments. These <laughs> two are mineral-based pigments, so that will exaggerate that granulation, granulating effect. If you mix these with a traditionally staining color, uh, you'll mm -hmm. see some granulation as a result, especially with the metallics and uh, the interference pigments. Probably less so with the chameleon and the spark colors because the glass isn't as heavy uh, as, as the mica, you know, in theory. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, they will probably exaggerate a granulating color and give you some additional texture uh, to a traditionally staining color. That's so cool. I, I would love to play with those. I honestly have not played with them, I'll be honest. But I think <laughs> I'm gonna have to go get them because they're beautiful. <laughs> they are, yeah, it's so, so fun to experiment and definitely try the pastels. Folks out there who have been using watercolors for a long time or painting with pastels for a long time. I know a lot of pastel artists who would begin one of their pieces in watercolor and then finish it in pastel, but the two um, materials are compatible to be mixed uh, wet into wet. Uh, so yeah, definitely and, uh, experiment with that. Is it a lot of pastels, isn't the binder gum Arabic? A lot of them are, yeah, yeah. So uh, a thing. lot of pastels use gum arabic as part or the primary binder. Uh, mm -hmm. The Rembrandt pastels use kaolin, which is china clay. It, mm -hmm. It's a, a wonderful uh, material that's also water soluble. Uh, so it uh, mixes and gives you, I don't, I don't know, it, it, it uh, gouache is the only thing that I can give a, a accurate comparison to. It makes, it creates a gouache effect. Uh, with your watercolors where you get added opacity uh, and that kind of matte look to it. The kaolin mm -hmm. binder kind of mats out the color a little bit. That's so cool. So I think uh, as far as all the questions, I might have missed one, maybe two. Uh, and if we did miss a question, guys, we will go back through and make sure to answer them. Uh, Jeff's Absolutely. really awesome about going back too. So you can actually ask him questions as well. 
Um, but if we did miss any questions throughout the demo, um, we'll make sure to check back on that. Uh, but we have a giveaway, don't we? We do have a giveaway. We're giving away this guy right here. So if you guys did not check that out before, um, in the for the demo, that is the specialty colors in the little half pan sets. Yes. Yes, these are half pans. So that's what it looks like. Very cool. Open it up here. Not very good in my gloves. That was the one that you were you were rotating, and everyone was literally as you were you know rotating it in the light. Everyone was going, "Oh my god." Isn't that, wasn't that cool? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's going to do it in this one, but yeah, no, not as much. But yeah, underneath the light there, you could actually see al almost what's going to be happening on the surface of the paper, right? Mm -hmm. So how are we doing this? Travel brush too. So how are we how are we doing the giveaway? Well, I've got a question, and I want you to type your answers into uh, the feed, and I will go back and pick a name. Uh, and communicate that, and then we'll ship you out uh, your set. So here's here's my question. Everybody ready? I think everyone is ready. All right. So there are three types of pigment categories based on origin. Just give me one of them. Ooh. Give me that's one a of good them. Question. Yeah. So three categories for pigments of origin. Of origin. And origin. Give one. Yeah. All right. So everybody, make sure you type in at least one origin for the pigments in the comments below on the live chat. If you're watching this in the future and you were not part of this giveaway, because as soon as this live chat is over, I usually give about 10, maybe 15 minutes leeway just to kind of be nice to the people that just barely got their answer in. But I will cut off of the time uh, with all the comments because they are time stamped. So make sure that you guys put it in the comments <laughs> below because I will know if you put it in late. And um, if you didn't get to be part of this giveaway, make sure you join us live, especially when I have people on. It's <laughs> a good indicator that I'm going to have freebies. But um, also, if you guys are not aware, you should also join our Facebook group, which is Jerry's Live on Facebook. Um, that I also put in reminders of when I have giveaways. So you can kind of be on the the in with the the cool kids crowd because i remind you guys like hey make sure you join uh live because we're going to be giving something awesome away so <laughs> if you do want to join that group though make sure you do answer the one question the one security question that we have um and if you don't answer that question you are deemed a robot and katie keeps telling me that i'm not allowed to have robots in my group <laughs> unfortunately so you won't be let in um but uh, I know you have your own social media, so. Yes, yes, so Royal Talents North America on Facebook, uh, look us up. We also have a live show every week called the Creator Studio Live where we interview artists. Uh, we look at their work together, they answer questions and we engage with the audience as well. Sometimes there's demos uh, too. Uh, sometimes I'll do a lecture kind of like today and demo today. Um, but we had actually last week our 75th episode Wow, uh, congratulations. Live. Yeah, and, and pretty much a year anniversary. We started it last May. So we, we've come full circle and, and it's been a great Very run. Awesome. But but please join us at, at Royal Talents North America, Royal Talents NA uh, on Facebook. And then also we have an Instagram show, same uh, Royal Talents North America. We do uh, on Monday and Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, quick demos. Uh, it's the Creator's Classroom on Mondays and the Creator's Studio on Wednesday. Classroom is more DIY projects, things you can do yourself at home. And the Wednesdays are more kind of deep dives into information about the materials. Awesome. Well, make sure. Oh, and do you have your own personal social media as well? Or uh, Jeff Olson Art. Yeah, Jeff Olson Art. That's my website and my Instagram sure. uh, and Facebook. So definitely look me up. Uh, uh, I'd love to, love to see you there. Very awesome. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this demo. Thank you again so much for being on with me. Uh, and everybody watching, make sure you join me next week, though, uh, because I'm going to be doing figure drawing, uh, gestural figure drawing with a live model. So we are going to be drawing from life, and it's going to be amazing, and I cannot wait. Uh, so make sure to join me then. Um, but thank you so much, Jeff, and I hope to see you on here real soon. Although, real soon. I hope to have you in the studio. I know it. I'm looking forward to it. Future oh, things. I'm so excited. In the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us and enjoy your evening. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye.